Russell, welcome. Wonderful to have you here on Erin on Sky News. Let's start with the movie. Is he one of the most fascinating characters that you've played? Well, certainly there's a, a treasure chest of information, um, not only about him, but his own writings that he's left behind. So from an actor's point of view, it was, you know, happy days when I discovered all that. Um, he, his real life, his experiences, you know, where he was born, the fact that he lived through the Second World War, he, you know, he, he, he fought against the fascists as a resistance fighter. He went to law school, became a lawyer. You know, he uh, worked as a journalist. You know, then when he, he, he took on uh, theology school after that, you know, he's nearly 30 at the time, works for 30 years with the Paulists, which is a brotherhood, an order which is about uh, communication, you know, so he was a radio producer, he was a television producer, you know, he wrote hundreds of articles for interfaith magazines. He also is the man who decided, I think it was in the early 50s, that that Italy should, you know, become a Magdalene country because it says it was, but never at any stage had the country actually committed to to Mother Mary. So he uh, convinced the Vatican to let him fly with an ex-U.S. Army helicopter that was hanging around around the country, uh, you know, the, a, a statue of Mary. So everybody, the whole country, you know, connected themselves to Mary. And that's a, a, an image that Fellini uses in one of his films where he has Christ flying across the sky. But the guy that came up with that idea was Gabriele Amorth, you know. And he left behind 12 books of his first-person experiences in the job of chief exorcist for the Vatican, which he did for 36 years. So, yes, an endlessly fascinating man. What about exorcism? This fascinates me. Is it something that you believe in? Well, if I if I switch the, the question, and if you ask, mm -hmm. if you were to ask me, do I believe that evil exists in the world? Um, I would have to say yes, I do. You know, I, on a daily basis, you look at the nightly news, or you know, if you look back through our history, there's been some atrocious things that human beings have committed against other human beings. So I do believe that evil exists, you know. Um, whether or not exorcism is the one and only way to rid ourselves of, of evil, I'm not sure if I can answer that question, you know. You, of course, uh, do a brilliant job of playing him. And what I love so much about it is that it's a horror film, but there's humour as well, and that helps if, like me, you're not that big into being scared. Yeah, well, I'm not a horror fan myself, you know. I, I like movies to have something other than the aim of, of scaring the bejesus out of me, you know. Um, <laughs> and that's the thing about this film is it does, as you say, it has all these other elements. You know, there's a touch of Da Vinci Code in there. There's a, you know, little scratching of Indiana Jones, you know. There's uh, those sort of elements. But then also, as you say, there's the comedic elements you know when you have a man as committed to his beliefs as Gabriella Moore and you're facing such extreme circumstances you can understand that occasionally you know there opens this big yawning gap and only a you know a deadpan line can fill that gap you know so you know I, I, I did enjoy that aspect of him and when I started finding out about that aspect of in in my research that's when I actually got excited because I could I could start to understand him you know here's a man who works with the afflicted all the time he's working with them and he's working with yeah. the families of people who are going through dark dark things you know and how does he manage to you know be the man who can bring some solace can bring some light you know and it came down to two things is the fundamental purity of his belief his belief is just unquestionable. And when you connect yeah. that to a sense of humor, you can understand that that is the sword and shield, that what protects him, what makes him good at his job, what keeps him at balance, you know? Now, I have to ask you, we here at Sky News, we love our politics. If you had to play an Australian Prime Minister, former or current, who would you like to play the most? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, this is really, really cheeky person at the back of my head that wants to say none of the bastards um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but I, I'd actually have to I'd have to sit and think about that I mean Harold Holt's story is just fascinating isn't it how he just disappeared but you know um, you know potentially uh, around federation is an interesting period in, uh, in, in Australia's history you know 
um, also having to deal with the Pacific War in, in Japan. That's an interesting period. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of Gough Whitlam. Uh, I think he was one of Australia's yes. great statesmen. I think he set things in place that, um, you know, give us the confidence that we have as a nation today. You know, little decisions that he made, you know, like like buying Blue Poles, the painting, you know, um, yes. and everybody just castigated him at the time and tried to, you know, you know, call him irresponsible. That painting is worth $500 million now or something. <laughs> I looked it up the other day. It's like, I mean, for, so every government decision should have that result, you know? <laughs> you get a 500 multiple out of every single dollar you spend and we'd be in a, in a great a great place, you know? Um, <laughs> well, I was thinking maybe Elbow because then you get to watch your own footy team play or Bob Hawke because then you get to skull beer a lot, obviously, responsibly. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, I think we had, if you think about it, and it's funny because we didn't know it at the time, but, you know, through my lifetime, you know, with political people, you know, like Goff, like Malcolm Fraser, like Bob Hawke, like Paul Keating. I mean, in reality, you know, we had some extremely intelligent men looking after the interests of, of our country, and we were very lucky. You know, you cut to a little while later, and uh, the same quality is not necessarily, it hasn't been there. You know, I think what we have with Anthony Albanese is a man who spent his life in politics, um, but he's also spent his life completely connected to his community. The fact, you know, here's what I'll tell you about Anthony Albanese, right? I've known him for 24, 25 years, right? And I've always known him in the context of being a, a South Sydney member and a South Sydney life member he became as well. You know, when I took over the club, every man and his dog asked me for stuff, you know? And uh, he never did. He never did. And he always turned up if there was something big going on for the club and we, we uh, wanted his presence, he always turned up. And he, you know, kept up his own membership and he buys his own tickets and, you know, that to me shows the quality of the guy, you know? Of course, if he'd asked me for something, I would have gone, yeah, you know, but he never did, you know, because he just, if he wanted to go to the game, he was going for his own reasons, you know? And uh, I think we're really lucky at the moment with all the opaque bullshit we've had to deal with for the last 10 or 15 years. We've got a guy <laughs> that is least gonna tell us the truth. Now, he might not make the decisions that you want individually every time, but over time, what Anthony will do is improve the lives of the people in this country. And that is a politician's job, not the other bullshit we've seen from people who have pretended to be in that position in the last decade or so. The actual job of improving people's lives. And that's what I believe he's going to do for us. Wow, you do not hold back. Uh, you also don't hold back when you're performing on stage and you've just announced that you're taking your tour around Australia, which is very exciting. Well, we're going to do an East Coast run. We did a couple of warm-up shows at the end of uh, January and they went down really well and the, the rooms were packed out. So that's given me uh, a little bit of confidence to bring this particular version of it. You know, I haven't done a lot of shows in Australia since around 2014. You know, but in the meantime, you know, I've been playing a lot overseas, whether it's New York or L.A. or London or Leeds or Dublin or the south of France or on the steps of the, you know, in the Spanish steps in Rome or uh, Stockholm or Reykjavik, you know. So uh, it, it just felt like it's time to sort of bring it home. The, the, the indoor garden part is a concept that's been around since 2009 and what it basically alludes to is like a whole bunch of different acts will, will play on the night and they, they you know, sometimes connect, sometimes, um, you know, sing together as well. You know, so that's what the show is and we're going to be, where do we start? We start uh, Byron Bay, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie. We're at the Bridge Hotel in Sydney on 19th and 20th of May. Then we're in the Cherry Bar in Melbourne, the Esplanade in Melbourne, Miami Marquetta on the Gold Coast. We're at the Trifford in Brisbane for a couple of nights. We're actually going to do a show at Australia Zoo. So you can go and see <laughs> the crocodiles and the snakes, and then you come and see me, and then you can go back and see some <laughs> koalas or whatever you want. Um, then we're at the Canberra Theatre. Then we're going to do a night at the Sydney Opera House, and then we're at the Manning Bar in Sydney. So some of these places are pubs, 
some of them are clubs and some of them are theatres. So I think the nature of the show will probably change whether or not people have got a comfy seat. And when they do have a comfy seat, I might tell a story or two. You never know. Oh, it sounds absolutely incredible. Now, if I told you, Russell, that I sang as well as I played tennis, and we've played tennis a few times with my good friend, Husey, now your good friend as well, and your beautiful girlfriend, Britt, would you allow me up on stage? Absolutely not. <laughs> not if your skill manages, manages, uh, matches your tennis ability. No, you'll have to just sit in the audience, please, Aaron. Thank you. Well, that is a solid no. No mincing of words there, Russell. <laughs> Very hurtful, but I'll take it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Cheers, love.